All right, I'm going to go over the diagram of disruptive technology and talk about the difference between disruptive technology and sustaining technology. Now, these are terms associated with Clayton Christensen, and the place that I encounter these when I teach economics is in my healthcare economics class. Uh, this is one of the foundational texts the innovator's prescription. And so this book actually lays this out in a healthcare economics way. But um, this diagram applies in non-healthcare settings. This is a general concept that we see at play in many, many different business settings. So how does the diagram work? And the diagram is going to map time on the x-axis and quality improvement on the y-axis. Or performance improvement is the language that Christensen and the other authors of that book use, but I think of this as quality, that's just the simplest way of thinking of it, where we're imagining a technology, and the classic example is a computer technology. If we rewind to the time period when computers took up three rooms, and they were huge and complicated, and only really, really large entities like large businesses or government could actually own one of these things. During that time, there was a sustaining innovation growth, which is essentially just improvements in that particular technology over time. And this kind of innovation that is improvement on existing technologies is what they call sustaining innovation. And the slope of this graph represents the rate of improvement over time. Now, they also add these lines that are upward sloping but have a flatter slope than the sort of slope mapping the best possible uses of this technology. And this flatter slope represents the quality improvements that customers can actually use. Because of course we know when we get a new computer, we're not going to use every possible bell and whistle, every possible innovation that's available on that computer. We're only going to use the, the parts of that innovation that happen to solve problems we want solved. So they highlight that difference by sort of having these upward sloping curves here that represent four different users. What is the pace of quality improvement that the average user experiences over time based on this really steep rate of improvement for sustaining technology? Now, let me erase the dotted lines here because I think that muddies up the diagram and makes it harder for us to understand disruptive technology, which is the next thing we're going to add. As a matter of fact, I'm going to erase all of these other words because this diagram um, has a z-axis, it's a three-dimensional diagram, and it looks kind of complicated, so we need to keep it simple. Now, the meaning of that line has not changed just because I erased some of the text. But this is sustaining innovation, and of course, because this is time, we're imagining time um, went way before this, so this axis just extends backwards in time. In which case, we're going to let this moment that's currently the zero moment on the graph represent a, a moment when disruptive innovation happened. And we're going to jump away from the diagram to create a new, um, a new line of innovation. Let me show you. All right, you see here that I've created this new axis that starts at this particular moment, and it's essentially going to jump off of this technology and make a technology that's uh, lower quality, so the quality axis, it should cross at a lower um, place on this axis, so let's say it's going to cross right there, that, that's where the disruptive innovation starts. But once that disruption happens, this technology takes on its own life and it's going to um, have a pace of quality improvement that's actually going to outpace this slope. This is a certain rate of improvement over time. Suddenly the technology gets cheaper and more broadly accessible. That's in the moment of disruption. And then it takes a life of its own when it comes to innovation. So let's map that. All right, so let's talk about what happened in this moment. And the classic example here is for our old technology, we had this big computer that took up three rooms. For our new technology, we have the personal computer which, when it's first invented, is much smaller and much lower quality than the fancy computer that takes up three rooms. But um, it's more broadly accessible, so many, many more businesses and many, many more 
people can own a personal computer. And once the personal computer is invented, even though this is a step down in terms of quality improvement, it's a step up in terms of how cheap it is and how accessible it is. So with more people who own that technology, that broader base of the public is going to innovate on their own to make this uh, personal computer improve at a faster rate. And if you think about it, to improve this fancy technology, the sustaining technology, you had to have uh, technicians who went into this room and specialists who worked for the university or who worked for these big companies. And that was the only base of people who, who understood how that, that product worked well enough to actually create innovations. Whereas with the new technology, many, many more people can contribute to the innovative process. So eventually, the personal computer is going to outstrip the um, the three-room computer in, in its own quality because of that improvement. And at this point, the three-room uh, three computer is probably be go going to become obsolete. In fact, the three-room computer may become obsolete before we even reach this point because people recognize, actually, um, the personal computer is just a much, much bigger bang for your buck. Now, one of the points that Christensen makes about disruptive technologies is that it tends to be different companies that do the disrupting. Like, the, the company that was creating this big fancy computer that they only sold to large corporations and universities, this company had a customer base and um, they liked that customer base. They had a business model that served that customer base well by developing innovations on this particular product. If they were to try to uh, disrupt themselves, for one, they're putting their own business model out of business a few years down the road, which isn't necessarily always a great business move, but also, um, creating technologies that serve the broader population, that, that's a different business model that might actually work best to do this disrupting. You need, you need a business model that's not aimed at quality improvement, but that's aimed at, at cost reduction, and that's just a different thing. You need different processes in place to make this happen. Now, once um, the disruptor invented the personal computer, they could start their own pathway of sustaining innovation on their own uh, little axis. But it doesn't tend to be the quality improvement innov innovators who do the disrupting. That, that tends to be somebody new coming along to disrupt. And then the other thing here is that this process moves forward. Like this is not the only moment of disruption that happened when it came to personal computers. In fact, you could Look at the moment when uh, smartphones took off and basically had a little computer in the smartphone. And that would be another moment of disruption. And it, this graph would get really messy if I tried to put it on this graph, but you could sort of imagine, okay, this is the moment in time when the smartphone disrupted the personal computer and you would jump off with a z-axis to start your own new, uh, new model of sustaining innovation after this particular disruption. So this model is pretty powerful in having multiple layers of disruption. It, the graph is really just a way of visualizing what's going on. In a lot of ways, it's an analogy, um, but it's a very helpful analogy for a really, really powerful concept.